Thank you very much. So, can you hear me? Wait. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this very energetic introduction. I hope I will be able to at least give a fraction of this energy in the next... Uh, Come on. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this time, no problem at all. Uh, distinguished participants, Pablo Prentis, Paolo Finkel is the head of the Renewable Energy Division at the International Energy Agency. And he said, I'm Italian, so it's been uh, quite actually a nice uh, surprise for me. Actually, this is the April Fool's Day, uh, and this is the reason why actually uh, we decided to. So thank you very much for the interruption as well. Uh, Dr. Paolo Frank, please. Thank you very much. I'm from Rome, and this is by far the best introduction to, my, to any of my speech in my life. So thanks, thanks already for that. Now, I'm serious. Um, in the next uh, half an hour or so, and, and sorry, my voice is uh, very far away from the quality of, that you just heard, uh, and that's thanks to the Paris weather and the Paris pollution. Um, in the ha next half an hour or so, I will give you an overview, and I would like to uh, introduce with two uh, introducing questions. Now, in 2040, can be wind larger than coal, and be it the first source of electricity in Europe? Of course, you will say. But I can tell you, you will say that. But I can tell you that in the energy world, not everybody thinks like that. Still, this is not a uh, Greenpeace new scenario. This is our scenario. And the World Energy Outlook 2014 is the 450 scenario that is the one which is compatible with uh, climate change uh, mitigation. <clears throat> I underline the word scenario, not by chance. This, will not, this is not a forecast. This will not come by itself. And my goal here is precisely to discuss with you the drivers and the challenges that need to be overcome to get there. So let me start to put the, the, the next steps, what, what's coming next, and to put that in the context of all renewables. And I think this is something that the wind community should do more, to look also at other renewables and what is happening in that field. Well, the first uh, comment is that renewable electricity is, has still a strong momentum. We forecast, this is a forecast, not a scenario that it will grow by 45% in, uh, by 2020. And one third, by that time, one third will be done by non-hydro technologies. Of course, hydro remains the bulk of the renewable electricity power, but all the others are growing too, and wind is, of course, the biggest share. Now, this is not for you, but may normally for the conventional industry, for those who think that renewables are small, we remind that already in 2013, the electricity from renewables worldwide was equal than the one of gas and was the double of nuclear. And I can tell you this is always a very impacting information in France, where I live. Now, however, this uh, overall positive trend hides two completely different stories in two different regions of the world, or let's say group of countries. In OECD countries, renewables in the next years will be 80% of additional generation, but this is severely hampered by the slow economic growth and the slow demand of electricity itself. And actually, we increasingly at the IA are of the opinion is that the electricity demand in OECD countries has already peaked for bad and also for good reasons, the good reasons being a structural shift uh, for energy efficiency. So this needs to be kept in mind when uh, thinking about what is the potential to grow. In the non-OECD country, the story is completely different. The big driver there is economic uh, security of supply and energy security. And there, renewables are the growing much faster in absolute terms, but they, today they are still only at one third of that uh, growth. And there are still barriers, in particular, in access to grids and financing. So, in one nutshell, strong momentum, but still barriers exist, and it could go faster than it actually does. Now, one remark on the Europeans, because it is true that in the past, uh, wind and also solar were mainly driven by the decarbonization policies, but many have overlooked that they have given an important contribution to energy security. 
Uh, you should know that European domestic gas production has been constantly declining, but in the field of electricity, this was overcompensated by renewables, mostly wind, as you can see in the graph, but in the coming years, also solar and biopower. So basically, the drivers are energy demand, but also energy security, and then climate change and pollution. Now, coming to wind, you know this story probably better than me. This is going, the next markets are going out of Europe. We will see an increasing number of additional uh, installations in other parts of the world. And I have to say that if you look at the all renewables, the global renewable capacity additions will actually be led by wind in the coming five to six years. And if I look um, uh, more at the main drivers of tomorrow for the wind market that we have to include in our analysis, we can have a picture of different countries in the world. Once again, we make a clear distinction in our analysis between countries that have a slow demand growth and others that have the dynamic demand growth. In the first group, certainly the US is proceeding well, both because of economics, like in Texas, or because of renewable portfolio standards. But increasingly also, we, he we hear stories like wind and solar can hedge against the risk of fossil fuel uh, fluctuation prices. In Latin America, you know very well that the combination of the market framework, which is based on long-term contracts and very good resource, which leads to very high capacity factors, has among the cheapest wind electricity generation in the world. In Brazil, we, there is also a good financing condition from the Brazilian Development Bank, but also there are some, uh, let's say, uh, extra costs because of local contents requirement. Something that we are looking uh, in the Europe, <coughs> wind is relatively more expensive, although with the um, exchange rates uh, uh, changing very quickly, this needs to be taken into account. We still think uh, there is uncertainty about the policy framework and in particular the market design in Europe for beyond 2030. We think that Europe, Europe is actually the only region in the world that does not allow for long-term contracts. And there are a number of things that need to be fixed to be integrated, to wind integrated be more in Europe. We look carefully at Africa. The front runner is of course South Africa with the PPA's program, but this is, we, we, this is spreading out in the whole continent and we also count on the forthcoming CIREC, the South African International Renewable Energy Conference in October to have a momentum in the whole continent. And we look, of course, at Asia and in particular China and in India as the main prevailing market. I would stress, and I will come back on that, that in China, both in China and India, there are still important grid connection and integration problems. They are improving, but they need to be fixed rather sooner than later. Otherwise, this will be a major barrier for wind development in those um, regions. Now, I will very, go very quickly on those uh, things here, not in the detail because you know these things better than me, but this is something that makes the life of an analyst, of a poor analyst at the IEA difficult. The first is technological progress, the, what we call the silent technological revolution which has increased your capacity factors of the new wind turbines massively. Um, most of the attention in the recent years in renewables has been focused for, on solar PV for good reasons because this was an, an incredible um, um, improvement. But those kind of things are important of course as well for wind. We observe large differences even in system prices across the world that we have to take care uh, in our analysis. We have also to understand what kind of these costs are right, are justified, are artificially maintained by wrong policies. And so, in other words, what of those costs can go down? And one element without going in detail, which we find increasingly difficult but important to track, is the cost of financing. With CapEx, and this is, by the way, both a wind and solar PV story. With the technology improving, the cost of the investments is going down, but the cost of financing makes a big part 
of the final levelized cost of energy. And this has very strong policy implications because, of course, if you have an uncertain policy uh, environment or uncertain market framework, too much uh, emphasized on the short term, banks, when you go to the bank and when you ask for uh, financing, they will ask you for a pre risk premium. And your competitiveness of your installation of wind is gone simply because someone is applying to you a much higher interest rates. And this is something that usually, in our scenarios, is not taken into account because this is extremely difficult to track. This needs to be tracked at country level. We do that in our medium-term market forecast, which I invite you to give a look when in, in next October when we publish the new one, because we track we try to track the economic attractiveness country by country, looking at the real financing conditions also. Now, in a nutshell, of course, the wind LCOEs, a lot of attention is on the best cases, in particular in the US, in the Brazil, um, but we have to admit that there are very large ranges of LCOEs in different countries in the world. And you have to into account these ranges when measuring the competitiveness of wind. In general, the LCOEs of wind is going down pretty massively. Wind offshore is relatively more expensive. We heard very good news from recent bids, both in the UK and most notably in, in Denmark. Of course, it's important to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. And the devils are in the detail of how much of the integration, grid interconnection costs are included or not included, but this is fun for us, uh, for the analysis at the IA. Uh, we look, of course, uh, carefully at the wind offshore, but um, one message remains, the industry needs to demonstrate in the next five years to radically decrease cost in order to be a competitive option. And I would like to repeat something which is mainly in, sometimes overlooked in one industry. This is a dynamic process where improvement is across all industries. All renewable industries are get, technologies are getting better. And also fossil fuel technologies are getting better. So this is a dynamic, not just because the wind industry is improving, which is of course welcome, this does automatically mean that it is fully competitive. This is a dynamic process which needs to be taken into account. Now, of course, the big news of 2014, of late 2014, was the sudden drop of oil prices. Um, to say something good uh, on the IA, we had signaled for months that the fundamentals of the oil market had changed and that we could expect such a sudden price drop. Now, in terms of wind and the electricity power market, this is not really worrisome. Wind does not, was almost never compete uh, with oil directly, only in a few countries, and in any case, the competition, the competitiveness is there. The trickiest thing is the competitiveness with gas. And so what you see here is the generation cost of a new gas power plant, both a CCGT for mid-merit production and an open cycle a gas turbine, in function of the price of the gas, which is the x-axis on the horizontal. And if I uh, compare that with the share, with the um, range of wind generation costs, you can see that there are many competitiveness opportunities around the world, even in Texas, even with very low shale prices like the US, which, by the way, we expect slightly to increase in the next, in the forthcoming years. This is also true for PV, um, which has the advantage in many places where there is uh, peak demand during summer and during the day to compete with open cycles. And it would be also the case for Japan if not by the fact that Japan pays both wind and solar PV very, very expensively, and probably Japan merits one separate, would, would merit a separate discussion. Now, this graph is an important one because some, the first reaction of many people was, oh, the oil prices have dropped 
the economics of renewables has become worse. This is not necessarily the case. The story is different from 10 years ago when renewables were, and wind also, and PV were still very expensive. And therefore, that, at that time, the comparison with investments with cheap oil prices were really tough. Today, the situation is slightly different. And don't forget, the investors make a comparative assessment of risk and benefits. And they now realize that the risk on the fossil fuel industry can be very significant and actually higher, much higher than investing in renewables, which have the merit that once, since the investment is all upfront, then the cost remain the same forever for 25 years. And this is why uh, many investors look, even in the Middle East, look at renewables options as a very interesting and competitive option in the long term. Now, having given that um, main message that the competitiveness, so the cost, is no longer really a barrier for wind. Wind is actually, I, I would, even the most conservative people at the IA can agree that wind is the cheapest source after lignite and, and coal, it depends where you are. The biggest challenge which is coming is grid integration. And as you know from very old times, the uh, conventional wisdom in the utility uh, milieus was um, that only a few percentages of renewables, it, here it's including hydro, by the way, yeah, uh, can be integrated in the grid, otherwise the grid becomes not reliable, even in the long run. Now, this is an article of the site in 92, so who cares? The problem is that I heard sentences like uh, every megawatt of wind needs a megawatt of backup of fossil fuel from utility, from very important utility CEOs one year ago. This is more worrisome. Now, of course, the truth is completely different. There are several places in the world that demonstrate that very high levels of integration can be achieved. Uh, in what, the, what matters is actually the level of integration on the, in real time and the, on the specific days. And both Portugal and Denmark had more than 90% of integration of variable shares for several days. As, as the undersecretary of, of uh, Portugal put it once at the Aniwia conference, we had 90% of wind and what happened? Nothing. That's, that's important to remind. It's also to, important to remind that when the solar eclipse was in Europe, nothing happened either. Now, on the large-scale integration is accomplished today and much more is to come. Already in 2012, wind was responsible for important shares of annual electricity generation in several countries. Denmark is, as you know, the leader but Ireland and the Iberian Peninsula are the next one, and then Germany. This needs to be summed up with PV, because this adds to the challenge of grid integration. And in 2018, we see this coming. So in three, in three years from now, <laughs> there will be more than 10 important markets in the world that will have more than 10% of annual generation from wind and solar PV, with some very, very important peaks in, uh, in uh, uh, some areas. And actually, the most important, the most uh, challenging situation in this graph is the one of Ireland and the Iberian Peninsula, because basically, electric electric electrically, they are an island. They are isolated from the rest. Denmark, as you know, is very well interconnected and can profit from important flow exchanges with other um, uh, countries, with other neighboring countries. What is important to remind, these are annually average valued. What is important to track is some instantaneous shares in some specific days. And they can be above 60% in many circumstances, and some often, in particular in spring. When you still have good wind and you start to have a good solar production, this can go easily to 90, 100% or even more than 100% of a certain demand of a given counter. Now, the second, the second uh, observation is that, of course, if you look at big, big countries like India, China, Brazil, 
the shares over the whole country is very small. But you need to look at, at, at a better level of disaggregation. And for instance, already in Tamil Nadu, uh, it, wind is already 13% of the annual share. And when it comes to solar PV, the things are even more complicated because they need, you need to go at the distribution level. And for instance, we were speaking about Bavaria this morning, but both Bavaria and Puglia in Italy, in the southern of Puglia, have a concentration of PV that can give occur to local hotspot in the uh, uh, grid integration issue. Now, we have published a major book last year on this theme, which is called The Power of Transformation. The choice of the world is not by chance. It is really, we need to speak about transforming the power system. Otherwise, we get this concept of grid integration wrong. The classical view was, this is changing now, really, uh, variable renewables are pushed in the rest. And therefore, they generate costs. Balancing, adequacy, grid connection, and these costs are summed up. This is wrong. These costs are interrelated with each other, and you cannot simply sum them up. And it is much better to look at a more system view perspective, well, the whole system is re-optimized according to the fact that there are now going to be large share of wind and solar PV in the clean energy mixes of the future. So integration is the, actually the wrong word. We should speak about power transformation for the clean, sustainable and affordable power mixes in the future. Now, we did a very uh, detailed analysis using a modeling which is an hourly dispatching optimization model. I will not go into the detail, but I signal that I will give more details in the afternoon in a panel session on that. Very briefly, we modeled a test system which, shows, which is shown here. You can see on the left what would be the generation cost of this system with zero wind and solar. And then you push a large quantity of wind solar in the system. This is very high. We put 45%, which is higher than Denmark in 2020. And the first result is that, indeed, if you don't allow the system to re-optimize, you can increase cost substantially. And this is something that other studies have shown, like the one of the Nuclear Energy Agency. Now, if you don't re-optimize, which is precisely the wrong strategy, the wrong thing to do. If you re-optimize, these costs can be limited to 10-15% and actually, since they actually depend both on the cost and the value of the technologies in the future, these extra costs at system level in the future could be zero. And our next step in our work will be to combine this type of analysis with our scenario analysis to make something which is dynamic in terms of technology learning. Um, one thing I would say, the first problem was was mentioned, uh, much more wind and much more solar will increase a lot balancing costs. Then the second thing, oh, the problem are the start run start ramping up of power plants that cannot be shut down, nuclear, coal. Now, these things are true, but they are not actually the main problem of the cost. The main problem of the cost is a different and lower utilization factor of conventional power plants. And this has a very, again, a very important implication for the two type of countries, markets that I told you before. In a dynamic market like China or India where demand is growing, you can more easily integrate renewables because you can increase renewables with flexibility. And I will come to this in a minute. In a stable economy, it's tougher. If you push more wind and solar, something else needs to go out. And this, I would say, a little bit uh, provokingly, has not yet been fully understood in Europe. Now. In very shortly, what are the main three principles for this system transformation? The first is to make a use a much better use of the things we have. 
And this also pertains renewables themselves. To have more system-friendly wind, for instance, with the use of the new turbines, of a better use of solar PV, with more geographic spread, with technology spread. So, in short, having in mind that variable renewables need to bring more value to the system and not just minimize their own generation cost. Excuse me. The second thing is to have a much better use of markets. Markets are not optimal in any place in the world. Probably the best one is Texas with ERCOT. And these, are, these two operations are very low cost, no regret options. They are not expensive measures. And the third point then is to take a system approach to develop flexibility. And for us, flexibility is not just backup of gas or coal. It is much more. It is, first of all, having better interconnections and grids, larger balancing areas, the possibility to have exchange flows from one country to another which have different demand profiles. It is dispatchable supply, not just gas, but also hydro, also solar thermal with uh, storage. It is a better use of storage, and we have important uh, economies coming from batteries, and above all is also enabling demand-side response. Now, this is maybe more relevant for PV than wind, but it is a very important point to have a cost-effective integration. Now, back to policies. Policies are still needed, and I will conclude on that, um, but they are also a major barrier because the policy risk is the factor that business is not capable to neither anticipate nor really to manage. And of course, any one of you which is, who is active in the United States knows this graph very uh, well. This is the up and downs of the additional capacities in wind, which perfectly reflect the up and downs in the uncertainties of the extension of the production tax credit in the United States. And this is something that we have been signaling to our governing members of the United States now for ages that this has become actually a very important constraining factor for the deployment of renewables in the states that could be much more than that if you had just a much more sensible, maybe less economic incentive, but more certain uh, uh, visual vision on what is coming from policies. And for us, the question mark in 2016 is serious. In, in our forecast, we really don't know what we will put in 2016 and, well, GWEC, I'm not sure how sure you are about your numbers, but I'm, I'm very interested to discuss this. Now, retroactive policies are the worst thing that you can do on Earth. And this, the Spain case is very well known. This is just an example of what happened in Romania, which killed um, a lot of renewables deployment. In the PV sector, both in Romania and Bulgaria, investors are ready to dismantle the PV modules and put them in another country. And I'm not sure whether this is good also for, can be done for wind. It's more complicated, I guess, and it's more expensive. But in a nutshell, we are signaling from the IA to all our policymakers that retroactive changes are by far the biggest mistake that you can do because it destroys for a long time the investor confidence. And we, when we speak with our Spanish friends who are very uh, proud of their new um, incentive scheme, that scheme would be good if we, 10 years ago, but today, I ask them the simple question, why should an investor come to Spain and not go in many other places in the world where the investment conditions are much more interesting? Who cares? Italy is the same. Um, and the cost of these measures are really bad. Keeping in the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal did it better. They had a merry, a long time intensive process rediscussing with stakeholders. They basically made the point, which is reasonable. Look, the whole country is in a crisis. There are people without jobs. 
It is, we have to share this burden. Okay. To share the burden of too high feed-in tariff is something which is a real policy issue that needs to be solved, but not with retroactive changes. And we have been, and we are very clear, not just me, but our executive director on that. Other policies are, have not worked at all. The carbon pricing, for instance. This is the famous uh, graph showing the evolution over time of the EU ETS carbon price over time. That's the most developed carbon market in the world. In, back in 2011, we were at a price of 19, 17, 18 euros. And at that time, we were saying this is not enough to trigger. This is good for fuel switching from coal to gas, but it is not necessarily enough to trigger investments in low carbon technologies. Guess how useful is a carbon price at 7 euros. Now, of course, in Europe, there is interaction of the crisis, of the gas prices, of the CO2, and the renewable policies, which is a perfect storm. But this needs to be fixed. And other barriers I already mentioned, but I would like to mention this one, which is still in place everywhere in the world, which are the fossil fuel subsidies. There are efforts to phase them out. There is also important work being done by the IA in conjunction with the OECD in the framework of the G20. But just to give you a hint, in, 20 for, in the period of high oil prices from 2011 to 2013, these fossil fuel subsidies were above 500 millions of dollars. Now, probably in 2015, they will drop because the oil prices have dropped. But look at the number in 2009, which was at an average import price of $60 per barrel. There are still 300 billions of dollars. The level of 500 billions of dollar of fossil fuel subsidy is actually an incentive to emit carbon. Instead of having a carbon price, we have an incentive which is equivalent to $110 per ton of carbon, of CO2, not carbon, to emit. Now, this is obviously crazy and not compatible with the biggest challenge that we have, which is climate change. Now, as you all know, we will have in our town in Paris at the end of this year um, the two degrees coal, uh, two degrees goal discussion. <laughs> coal, it's a uh, Freud is at work here. Now, <laughs> the WIO colleagues uh, entitled this slide Last Chance. Some already speak about Last Tango. Now, remaining more factual, if we take the central scenario of the world energy outlook, in 2040, we will have finished the entire cumulative CO2 budget to remain on a two degrees path. And I would say this is even a conservative assumption because we, the effects are, as you know, nonlinear. So I'm, I would be, as a physicist, that would be very concerned that this is actually, that we can go up to this level. Now, the IA has calculated the level of investment that would be needed. And actually, this is a not an enormous additional investment, in particular in renewables. It means going from 350 to something like 500 billions per year, the biggest change is in energy efficiency and in particular in housing and transport because these are the two sectors that really uh, cause the major headache for the de decarbonization. What is the, if I have to choose one specific policy issues that could be determinant this is to have a real market and good market design. And why? I just said before that policy is good, but policy is also risky for investors. And therefore, the best result that we could do is to have a market design which is more consistent with the deployment of renewables and which diminishes this policy risk. It is a matter of fact, and we now widely recognize this, that if you have, excuse me, just wholesale spot power market, like in most OECD countries, there will be two challenges. 
financing capital intensive renewables, and actually this is also true for nuclear and carbon capture and storage. I put variable in the brackets because variable renewables have an additional problem. You will, if you only have spot market prices, if you have high shares of wind and PV, guess when the prices will be low. It will be always when there is a lot of wind and there is a lot of PV. And the second problem is that those kind of markets are not capable to have to foster flexibility with uncertain capacity factors. So everybody makes the case for storage, but in the current market design, in particular in Europe, there is no incentive for investing in storage at all. The peak that was there in the, some time ago has already disappeared because of PV. So we need to invent something different. We had an important workshop last week in Paris about market design, which I found very interesting. To be honest, when I went out from the meeting, I had more questions than when I entered the room, which is actually a positive thing. It seems that I start to learn really something. Without going in the details, I would, element, I would list three elements that we think the future appropriate power market design will need to have. Some kind of long-term price signals to attract investments in high capex technologies because these will be the technologies of the sustainable power mix in the future. At the same time, some short-term price signals to reflect the value of power and flexibility at all times. The market needs to reflect somehow that you want to have wind and solar and whatever kind of energy when you need it. And the third is, of course, a robust pricing of externalities, of carbon, but also of other externalities, in the line of energy security and climate goals. If this is achieved, then I think we can be more optimistic that the future will not look like the second bar, the six degrees, which is completely unsustainable, but rather than our two degrees scenarios. I show you here two of those scenarios, the central one, which is economically optimized, and the second, the so-called high renewable scenario. And just very shortly, you can see the mix today is done basically by 70% of fossils and 20% of renewables. In 2050, we will need to have 20% or even less 10% of fossils and 65 to 80% of renewables. This, I repeat, this is not a scenario of Greenpeace. These are our scenarios of the International Energy Agency if we are serious with the decarbonization and also energy security. Uh, if we are serious with that, we see this roadmap possible for wind, an incredibly massive augmentation from the hundreds of terawatt hours of today up to more than 6,000 terawatt hours in 2050 produced by wind, more than 7,000 terawatt hours in the case of the high rent scenario, and this means basically a range which is somewhere between 15 and 18 percent of global electricity. And I know some. I know that, for instance, GWEC has higher energy efficiency scenarios that could raise this um, um, share higher. But don't also energy efficiency is of course very good and should come first. But don't forget that we will go for a higher electrification in the world, and this is actually good news, because the power sector can be decarbonized easier than the heating and the transport sector. So now, let me to conclude. We see a potential enormous role of wind in a sustainable energy mix, but at a number, a number of conditions needs to materialize. And the most important thing is that the policymakers need to make a distinction between the past, which, was, which were economic incentives, and the future, which is creating the right market and regulatory framework to attract investment in this sector and in the other renewables. Because I wish to again repeat that the future remains in the policy hands, but policy is also risky. It's not just good, and you know better than who has invested in the wrong countries knows that very well. 
and the electricity markets are suboptimal uh, today for low carbon generation basically in the whole world and probably again with the only exception of Texas. Therefore, and this is our main mo uh, message to policymakers, the policy and market design should focus on fostering competition, innovation, flexibility, and of course, a pricing of carbon. At these conditions, we can be more optimistic for Paris and more optimistic for a more sustainable world in the future. I thank you very much for your attention, and of course, I welcome any questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulo. Um, my name is Johan van der Berg from the South African Wind Energy Association. Um, in South Africa, we have a specific set of circumstances, you know, that I just want to test whether this will occur sufficiently widely that this is something that should be taken into account. So, um, we are energy constrained at the moment, and in 2014, that led to the fact that the 1,700 or so megawatts that we have installed on a net basis cost the government less than zero. Um, and that's because it saved us in OCGT use and in load shedding hours. And that's a situation that will persist for two or three or four years into the future. And I, you know, I don't know in how many places this is true, but it definitely changes the dynamic. I, I totally agree with you, and this is why I stress so much the difference between the dynamic markets and the state in the stable markets because the problems are completely different. In your country, as in China and in India, the grid integration problem is the big issue. And if I have to have a comment on how this is modeled in your policy planning of South Africa, the modeling is very, very poor and very superficial. And you, we would need a better modeling for South Africa to really see what is the, that you have a much higher potential for wind in your country. In the short term, you are totally right. You're basically costing zero to the society. You are a win-win situation for the society. I'm Morten from uh, Vestas Wind Systems. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this presentation. It's really impressive and nice to see the IEA's uh, high ambitions when it comes to wind energy. I, um, I noticed your somewhat harsh criticism of the, the European uh, situation when it comes to market design and, and finding out how to um, close down fossil plants, etc. I'm wondering uh, how you see uh, now with the, with, the, with the launch of the, uh, the Energy Union, uh, will this change anything in your perspective and, and how do you see the future for, for the European market design based on this? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, I have to say when I read the first two pages of the communication of the Energy Commission, of the, uh, um, of the European Commission, I was impressed. This is very different wording from the past, with a very clear political vision and the agenda. So that's a very good first step. And for that reason, I'm, we can be a little bit more optimistic. Now, then the devil is, of course, in the detail and the, in the room of the elephants the elephants being the member state and their real willingness to give up some of their sovereignty to Brussels and to a European context. The energy union is a very good concept in wording, but the member countries have really to understand that their future energy security is something that they cannot deal in the anymore just at national level, but at continental level. And I don't think we are still there. However, I see sign of optimism. I see a big important push from Juncker himself, from Sefcovic, from Tusk, uh, that could be a momentum for this. This is aspect number one. But we will see what the council, what the parliament, how the member countries will really react. And when it comes, for instance, to the discussion on the European targets, this is a similar discussion. This is very good, but if you don't really make a detailed governance, which was the main success factors of the Renewable Energy Directive in 2020, it was not the target, it was the national action plans on renewables. Uh, this could fail. 
So I would say, this is, now this is number one. The second thing is to realize that a wholesale power market with a price which is 30 euros and going down doesn't serve to anything. And to realize that if Europe is consistent with its decarbonization agenda, this means having an agenda for phasing out something. This is different from China and South Africa. Wind in there is at zero cost. Wind and PV push out something in Europe, and in particular they have squeezed gas, which is, as you know, a polemic um, uh, discussion because we didn't want to have um, uh, more coal, we wanted to have more gas, right? <laughs> this, I think, is the um, more important point. I see for the market design, we need, I think, a discussion on long-term prices, at least to allow them on a voluntary basis, not necessarily following a Brazilian model, but on a voluntary basis, there are some, are some countries in Latin America that do that, because I don't think that just long-term hedging <laughs> instruments are enough, and by the way, long-term at the moment is six years. That's, for me, that's, if I have to sing, single out one specific problem, that's the sickness of Europe today. This does not exist anywhere else. And then, as I said, to have a functioning market that also values flexibility. And flexibility are not just capacity markets. This is the, an attempt, and in particular not national capacity markets, which is an attempt to uh, protect existing assets in the conventional sector. Let's be frank, That's, this is what, what it is. And we are very critical on national capacity markets. We need a European-wide market for flexibility products, most of which will be done by conventional power, by storage, by demand-side response, but some of which could be done by variable renewables as well. This is what we need. Steve, and I think over there. Well, uh, my name is Ziad Sabra from Jordan. Uh, thank you, Paolo, for your interesting and valuable presentations. Always I heard from you those nice uh, figures and updating on the, on the energy sector. Uh, actually, uh, my question on the cost figures. You know, uh, a country like Jordan, we are a big importer of energy, and we do have an energy strategy till 2020. And in that energy strategy, which was developed in 2007, we were aiming to have to install uh, about 1,200 megawatt of wind power and 600 megawatt of solar. Now, to be frank, we are now, as a government, reluctant to proceed with the wind because, you know, the cost figures now for solar BV is dramatically sinking down and they are a little bit competitive uh, for the wind. So I don't know why, although the wind industry have started earlier in the 80s and it was really very competitive with the conventional, with the solar, the solar cost of BV was about 45 cents per kilowatt hour. Now it's, I think we were together in Abu Dhabi with uh, uh, the future summit and you know Diwa is five, six US cents. So no, I don't know why, what, what's your message to the wind suppliers, to the wind uh, industry, why they did not uh, bring down their cost uh, to a lowest figures now? I mean, the governments are reluctant to proceed with their plans for the wind while they have cheapest resources, for example, solar BV. CSP, there is still a lot has to be done in order to have those technologies uh, proven and competitive to, to governments. Uh, so I would like to hear from you really as IEA, what's uh, your your suggestions and thank you very much. Thank you for the good uh, question. The short answer is to have a well-balanced portfolio of technologies. You will need them all. You will need wind for certain reasons, you will need solar PV for other reasons, and you even would need some part of concentrated solar power because this will provide you the dispatchable power that you need with the in-built storage. You cannot do everything. You, that, that's the main message. The governments and the analysts and the policymakers should look at the value of the portfolio of technologies, in particular of portfolio of renewables, 
to the overall power system and not be obsessed to just deploy the cheapest technology of the moment. That's not the goal. The goal is to have a very well-balanced portfolio that can give a good value to the system over a long period, which is a completely different uh, problematic. And therefore, you will need a mix. Of course, I encourage the wind sector to look carefully at the competition of PV. This will come more and more because we hear some PV uh, people saying they will go down further with the cost and I, I'm a semiconductor physicist by background, I tell you this is possible. But that's not the point. You cannot do everything with just PV. This would be the wrong approach. You will need to develop a good portfolio and there is wide space for both wind and PV together and other renewable energy technologies as well. Don't forget hydro where hydro is available. And even geothermal like in, in some parts of Africa. So the, a well-balanced portfolio is the answer. Steve. <coughs> um, yeah, as, as we discussed last week in Paris, the, uh, uh, a very simple short-term solution to Europe's problems would in effect be um, the implementation of a real carbon price and put the lignite out of business and make it unattainable uncompetitive to build any more. Do you see any uh, prospects and or I guess what would be helpful or interesting at least would be if the IEA would just come out and say that plainly and maybe you already have and we haven't re-amplified you enough. And my second question is is that everybody is uh, in terms of market <coughs> operation very enamored of ERCOT which they've done a great job in many ways. ERCOT in Texas. Um, is that because it's nice to be able to finally say something good about the United States? Because to me, which is okay, but the second thing is that I always prefer to use the example of Nordpool as an effective functioning international balancing market. Um, is there a reason why you don't use that instead? Why, why Aircott over Nordpool? The Nordpool has a quite uh, peculiar situation which is that the amount of flexible hydro that um, works as a storage pump is something that you don't have in many other parts of the world. Eh? So the hydro of Norway, the hydro of Sweden, uh, you have a certain flexibility conditions in the Nordic pool that are not there in other places. The second observation is, um, in, and that's, that's more a question of the future, um, the coal part is still high enough to let this part work well for energy only market. What I'm missing is the long term price signal in the energy market, but of course this is compensated, and I come to your first point, by a carbon tax. Because the Nordic, power, Nordic countries are a living example of how a well, of a transparent carbon tax can be beneficial to the economic development. The GDP has grown and the carbon tax is there. So I think that's your right. The fact that we need a robust carbon pricing and not just a carbon pricing is something that we have said repeatedly. As you know, the carbon tax in many other countries, including in most uh, other parts of Europe, is very unpopular. You may remember what happened in France when they tried to introduce it. And I would not even dare to, uh, to speak about it in uh, Italy, but maybe that's the wrong approach because this could actually, of course, if presented in a carbon neutral, in a budget neutral way, this could be an easy, an easy, uh, something that could be implemented reasonably well. I agree, the concept and the message of an, a robust carbon price is in whatever form, a tax or a more robust price, for instance, the, car the floor of the UK is an interesting approach with the only small detail that they don't want it at European level, the same UK people, uh, and that, that could be fine. Probably one way out is to reform the ETS and going also by the introduction of cap and floors that then, and then the rest is the, the market can, can work on carbon pricing. I think we will say something about that on COP21 
but I cannot already tell you exactly what. I think this was the last question that I'm allowed to answer. This is what I understand. So thank you very much again for your attention. <laughs> Excuse me for my voice. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I would Director General for Renewable Energy is also here. Uh, I also would like to invite Yusuf. Uh, there will be a, a submittal of a plate of appreciation. uzadı biliyorsunuz. Ee, diğer oturumları Now we will start the other session 10 minutes. So at 10:40. Let's just have a quick coffee break, okay? So uh, we shall start at 10:40.